Welcome back, Guardians. In today's report, we will begin to unravel the mystery of corruption. More specifically, the corruption the darkness seems to place upon Guardians and how it can affect you. There are, of course, the legends, the stories mixed with conjecture, and the rumor on how Dredgen Yore ultimately turned, falling to the corruption of the darkness and forever living in infamy. But the true question is, how? How does a guardian become so immersed in perversion that corruption becomes preferable to death? A relative newcomer to the tower, Eris Morn, could speak to the corruption and its potential enthrallment over a guardian. Visibly, she is changed, taking the visage of any hive minion, three ocular points with darkness pouring outwards. But how can she survive this possession while others cannot? Eris remained lost among the darkest shadows of the Hellmouth for countless cycles. Despite all odds, she endured. Using the very dark, she battled to emerge a changed warrior, driven, some would say possessed. The Speaker and Commander Zavala find her compulsions a sickness, convinced she has been fully seduced by the shadows. Eris's loyalty remains clear. Her actions speak for such. She led a team of guardians to the defense of Rasputin. She helped the city vanguard defeat Omnigul, one of Crota's leading generals, and has given more information about the hive motives than we have ever had. But the question remains, is she of the light? Is the light she once had still bound to her? She no longer has her ghost, and as reported, it was lost during an incursion against Crota. We know most of her fire team was eliminated, ultimately unprepared for what awaited within Luna. But did she lose more than just her friends? Did she lose herself? Unfortunately, no record or report can answer that question. We don't have omnipresence. We can't look into any individual and determine what their soul is. What we can determine is something much more clear. The contrast of Ares Morn to that of Dredgen Yor. This is a record of Dredgen Yor. The nobleman stood and the people looked to him. For he was a beacon, hope given form, yet still only a man. And within that truth there was a great promise. If one man could stand against the night, then so too could anyone. Everyone. Slowly the shadow's whisper became a voice, a dark call, offering glories enough to make even the brightest light wander. He knew he was fading, yet he still yearned. On his last day he sat and watched the sun fall, his final thoughts pure of mind if not body, held to a fleeting hope. Though they would suffer for the man he would become, the people would remember him as he had been. And so, the noble man hid himself beneath a darkness no flesh should touch, and gave up his mortal self to claim a new birthright. Whether this was choice or destiny is a truth known only to fate. The first and only of his family, the sole forebearer and the last descendant of the name Yor. In his first moments as a new being, he looked down at his rose and realized for the first time that it held no petals, only the jagged purpose of angry thorns. The story of Dredgen Yor and his lead slinger the Rose, also referred to Thorn, gives us actual detail on the process of corruption, or at least some insight. Ultimately, Yor feared death, the end of things, something that comes to all beings of life. Whether it was pride or the whispers of the darkness that motivated him to take such brash action is currently conjecture, but Yor's name will forever live in infamy. His actions as a guardian, a caretaker of the light, to those deemed innocent, unworthy of his hatred, would further him into being a being of unrecognizable power. The process of corruption is slow. It takes months, years, or even longer to fully seed in someone. But the darkness seems to cling strongly towards the light, as if friction is the only thing it appreciates. Beings of immense light, guardians like Yor and Morn, would see themselves afflicted. But there has to be a catalyst, a certain vice, if you will, so that the weakness may be taken advantage of. The door must be open for any trespasser to enter. But there is no medical terminology or prognosis that can be applied to the corruption. Medical science can, of course, be applied, but the science lacks doctors in the strict field of darkness-based afflictions. If anything can be termed to this corruption, it would be a certain type of transformation parasite. Instead of just latching on to the host and attempting cohabitation, this parasite will conduct visible changes to the host. Eris Morn is our example. She is visibly changed. Once a standard awoken with humanoid features, 
she no longer seems to be, well, a guardian. Two positions of thought on the darkness can help us further explain the corruption that can take root in guardians. The first is the Pujari position. It describes the darkness as a force with both physical and moral presence, an actualization of evil. Pujari art depicts the darkness as a great storm or as a change in conduct, a corruption that emerged from within and poisoned the golden age. The Pujari would argue that the darkness has a physical appearance. The corruption of Morn's visage is our example. The moral presence is the fight within an individual. Yor is our example here. The corruption would fight over his mind, his heart, and ultimately his soul. But what isn't explained is how the darkness operates. The Pujari would argue that the darkness is within us and simply awaits opportunities to present itself. These opportunities could be our vices, pride, the fear of death, isolation, loneliness, anything that can be determined as a weakness that the darkness and its corruption can use. The second position is the acataleptic clause. It claims that we are intrinsically unable to understand the darkness. In many respects, this belief parallels the Praxic Creed, which suggests that we should stop worrying about the nature of darkness and focus on resisting and defeating it. The pretense here is that whatever we discuss in these reports is ultimately fruitless. It's mixed with conjecture and some biased usage of facts. We are no closer to understanding this corruption. This may honestly be the case. For all the knowledge in the city, the libraries, the think tanks, and the Cryptarch's resources, we may never understand what this corruption is. We have ideas on the matter, like this report, but ultimately, that is all they are. The one discernible fact that we can take from this report is the lesson that Yor and Morn teach us. Yor would teach us that all things come to an end. Those who count on us depend on us. Remember our names. They will one day fade away. It should mean that we should do all we can in the present, the current passage of time, to help and protect those with our light. It should mean more than our name being written down or placed upon an idol. Vanity is our enemy. Pride is our enemy. The fear of death is our enemy. Erebus Morn would teach us that redemption is always ascertainable. She led an unprepared fire team into a fortress of Hive to exact justice upon a demigod. She failed. She failed the lives of the guardians that had been thrust upon her. She failed the city that looked to her, and she failed the light that was within her. She consumed the darkness, out of perhaps fear of death or isolation, but she returned to the light of the Traveler. She now works with every guardian, regardless of their position, so that they may learn from her mistakes. She uses her knowledge of the enemy to break their will and tear down the plans of their lieutenants. She has and is continuing to redeem herself through her actions bathed in light. These are the lessons we can glean from this corruption. No guardian is so pure that they are immune, and no guardian is so far lost that they cannot find their way back into the light. Stay safe, guardians, as this corruption will pursue your light indefinitely.